Men då ska vi hälsa nästa talare, Damon Barrett. Välkommen fram. Damon är en internationellt erkänd figur för sitt ledande arbete inom områdena just mänskliga rättigheter och narkotikakontroll. Och med ett intressant fokus, nämligen på inkonsekvensen mellan de här två regimerna. Det finns ju en viss intressant inkonsekvens mellan dessa två. Han är en av grunderna av Internationellt centrum för mänskliga rättigheter och narkotikapolitik vid universitetet i Essex. Eh, har varit med i den brittiska delegationen till FNs narkotikakommission och varit biträdande direktör på Harm Reduction International. Eh, bland annat, men just nu så är Damon doktorand på juridiska institutionen på Stockholms universitet. Eh, där han forskar i internationell rätt rörande narkotikakontroll. Eh, och här idag så ska du prata om mänskliga rättigheter och ungas. Var står Sverige någonstans? Uh, och uh, jag vet inte om du väljer att prata på svenska eller engelska, men jag ja, tror att ja, uh, på engelska, ett eftersom jag har ett problem med min svenska är så jättedåligt. <laughs> men uh, jag har ett an andra problem med uh, att jag är förkyld. Så om jag säger någonting som är ointelligent, är förkylning, inte jag. Um, <laughs> Okej, okay, um, I'm going to speak in English because um, my Swedish is about the level of a, a five year old. So uh, I don't think I can talk about this at that level. Um, uh, yeah, I've been working on uh, human rights and drugs issues for almost um, 10 years. And uh, I, um, I came into drug policy by, by mistake. I was at Save the Children in the UK at the time. And uh, a job came up in harm reduction. I didn't know what harm reduction was, but my job at Save the Children was out of funding. So I moved. And it's, uh, it's a fascinating area because, um, as this picture shows, really, uh, it touches on pretty much every aspect of human rights that there is. Uh, you'll have heard people saying, I think, that it's a very uh, complex problem. Um, it is. It's a very complicated problem, and it touches on lots of areas of social policy. And because of that, it touches on lots of areas of human rights and human rights law, which is the bit I work on. But um, let me clarify my focus. I'll get to this uh, in a second. Uh, I said, where does Sweden stand? Uh, I don't want to oversimplify. I, I'm not suggesting that there's some group of countries that are against human rights and then another group of countries that are for human rights in this uh, argument. Well, actually, there's a few. There's Saudi Arabia chopping heads off and so on. There's a few. The real, the real thing I'm talking about here is leadership. There is a human rights debate going on around drugs. And the question is where Sweden stands in it. Um, does it want to be at the tail end of it? And every so often putting up its hand and saying, yeah, please don't kill people. Or does it lead that debate and uh, determine uh, how it's talked about and what its terms are? Um, so that speaks to Sweden's image on the international stage. Um, and also the kinds of partners Sweden wants. Um, so that's broadly what I'm talking about, and I've got some suggestions for Sweden at the end. Some of them are very easy in my view, some of them are very hard. Uh, but I think they're all important, and whether they're realistic or not is, is up to Sweden. Um, so what, the question then is, what does it take to be a leader on human rights um, in, the, in, this, in this sector? The first is acknowledging all of this stuff. Um, what I've got here is pictures going everywhere from production in Colombia, that's the top left. That's a picture I took in a place in Colombia called Guaviare. You can see the rainforest has been cut into there in order to grow coca. It's now a, 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 a fruit plantation, but we're moving into Mexico here in the middle. I've put an orphan child there to represent the violence in Mexico. We move into the US and overcrowding in prisons over here crossing borders and the danger of that and the death penalty in Indonesia here, the detention of drug users in Cambodia, and an armed raid on a school in the US. What I'm doing with this is to show you that at every stage, from production to use, there are human rights issues involved. Um, it doesn't matter which bit you're at. And it seems to me that to divorce the international system from these consequences is uh, to uh, relinquish responsibility that all states hold for these consequences. Because <clears throat> while I've heard already uh, twice that the conventions are sufficiently flexible, 
um, that's problematic in three different ways. The first, quite simply, is that they're not flexible enough. Not, not even nearly flexible enough. We heard about scheduling. Um, cannabis isn't just in Schedule 1, it's in Schedule 4 of the 61 single convention, which means it's, it's, it's only on the most restricted. Not just that, it never went through the procedure um, that was mentioned, the, the, the evidence-based procedure. It was written into the conventions themselves without that. Um, even the leading experts now say we need to reassess opium and we need to reassess heroin and reassess cannabis and so on. And you know what? The entire system of the 61 convention is built on the principle of similarity with those three drugs that were never went through that process. The entire, the entire backbone of the system is broken. Um, moreover, there are flexibilities with regard to the demand side use, right? Uh, I do want to clarify one thing, the, the conventions, the main, when we talk about criminalizing use, okay, the main article people are concerned about is from the Drug Trafficking Convention, it's Article 3, Paragraph 2, okay? It, you don't ha it doesn't say anything about use, okay? So you really don't have to go as far as Sweden went in criminalizing the experience of being under the influence, right? Um, it does say something about possession, and it does say that states have to criminalize possession. But there's a safety valve, a get-out clause, which is that if it's unconstitutional to criminalize possession, or if it would be contrary to the basic uh, uh, legal standards in the country, then you don't have to do it. You know, what's odd about that? It means that when they were writing the convention, they knew that this might be unconstitutional. Uh, and in some countries it has been found to be unconstitutional, in Italy, in Germany, in uh, Argentina, and elsewhere. So there is a flexibility there. And it's not allowed for the supply side. So, uh, if you are growing coca in Latin America, there's no safety valve for you. That's it. There's no safety valve, there's no constitutionality clause saving you. You're, you're, that, that's to be criminalized. It, which is what Bolivia never did. I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump through my slides because I don't have many, but I wanted to, this is, um, uh, uh, Ted just mentioned this. Bolivia, the, 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 there's no flexibility in the convention for traditional uses of these substances either. So the 61 convention explicitly said that we have to wipe out the quasi-medicinal use of opium, the traditional use of opium, it's still used in many traditional ways. Um, the traditional uses of the coca leaf, which is the one that's taken up the most attention um, because Bolivia took such a stand on it. Um, Although the Rastafari religion came somewhat after the 61 Convention, nonetheless, it also says that the Rastafari can't use cannabis in their religious uh, ceremonies today. Um, I, this was debated, this was agreed in the 1950s, and I don't think that the standards of the 1950s are the things we should hold ourselves today, especially with regard to the way minorities and religious minorities and indigenous peoples were considered in the 1950s, to compare to the way we treat people today. Um, I think the re relevant provisions are uh, illegitimate these days. Uh, so this is what Ted mentioned, this is the, the uh, Swedish objection to Bolivia. Bolivia, what it did was it, it, it pulled itself out of this treaty and then it got back in with a thing called a reservation saying, look, we'll, we'll be, we, we can agree to all of it except this bit because in our constitution, the coca leaf has a protected uh, position. Uh, of course, when um, Bolivia entered into the convention, it was under the dictatorship of Hugo Banzer, and now it's under the presidency of an indigenous leader. So the, the viewpoint changed over time. Um, Sweden was the only country in its objection that attacked the cultural uses of the, of the, the, the substance in question. And I think that was a mistake. And uh, one of my suggestions I'll make now is that Sweden should remove this objection. It takes a letter to the Secretary General. It doesn't matter now. Bolivia's done it. It doesn't matter. And all it does is it shifts Swedish, uh, the, the uh, Swedish reputation from one that at all costs will protect the regime and the other that says, look, it's 2016 next year. Maybe, uh, maybe we should respect the uh, tradition of Bolivia. That's, I think that's one of my easiest suggestions. I think it would send the right message to uh, the developing world, to, uh, to the rest of the world, that there's a bit of a shift going on. Not to mention that entering a, res a reservation on a treaty is a per perfectly legal and legitimate thing to do. Um, 
Okay, so then my other, my other um, uh, problem with the treaties has to do with this picture here. Uh, too often we see these rights abuses, okay? And people get executed in Indonesia, uh, people are denied treatment in a certain country, people are locked up here, um, there's invasive measures in schools, everybody's who is using a subject to criminal laws, and what happens is the finger gets pointed at uh, a particularly abusive police force or a particularly overzealous country. And in that way, all of the states that got together over all of these decades and set up an infrastructure within which those things happen get to say it's not our fault. And uh, the treaties are at the center of that debate because they set up the legal framework for doing it. So, uh, you, ta okay. you take an international treaty, three of them in fact, that legally uh, set out make legally binding a theory for how you deal with the, the world's drug problem, whatever that is, right? And they make it legally binding on all states. And all states say, well, okay, we have to criminalize the supply chain, which is what they did, which engages your criminal justice system in the process of dealing with your health problem of drugs, okay? Now, you might get away with that in Sweden. You might get away with that, with the social safety nets here and the fair trials and all of that. You take the same thing and you put it in Indonesia and you're asking for a problem. You take the same thing and you put it in Russia and you're asking for a problem. My outcome from that is, don't even attempt a prohibitionist regime until you have the standard of living that you have here. And even then you're gonna face problems. Um, what I call that is a, a human rights risk environment. The, the, the drugs conventions can't be absolved of the fact that all of these abuses and more uh, happen in the name of an international consensus uh, on drugs. Um, we talk often about, and, and we heard uh, from Social Studios and from Lena, about uh, international cooperation. Well, that's, that's a principle. They call it shared responsibility. Well, who takes shared responsibility for that? That's my question. And uh, I'm not being, I'm being very critical, but of course, I can't be anything but of this system. But well, there is a positive answer to that, which is to, ask, is to ask the right questions. I'll get to that at the end. The other reason the, the treaties can't be absolved of all of this is because there's big gaps in them. Uh, people talk about children a lot in drug policy, but if you look at the drugs conventions, children arise twice, and only in the trafficking convention, and only to say that drugs are a threat to them, and to say that there's certain offenses that are more serious because children are involved. Okay, fine. But what does that really say about the measures that should be adopted to protect children, if at all? Because, I'll tell you something, the, the strategy set out in the drugs conventions doesn't... Uh, in fact, you can pick any aspect of child rights you like, and I can probably point to a violation of that in the name of drug control somewhere as well. And I don't see that being answered for either. Um, the thing is, there's, there's, there's again, there's a positive response to that, which is that to recognize that there are three drugs conventions and they're specific to drugs but they're within the wider framework of international law which is really wide so just off the top of my head the framework for drug control isn't just the drugs conventions it's the three drug conventions there's the transnational organized crime convention there's nine human rights treaties there's the convention on uh, the protection of cultural heritage there's the protection of biological diversity there's the convention on the law of the sea it goes on and on and on and what you're into there is an interpretive um, debate amongst those various things. The problem is, when we get to the UN, the framework tends to be the drugs conventions with a bit of lip service to human rights. And there's conflicts between those regimes, uh, as I think I mentioned with regard to indigenous rights. So the conventions are part of the problem, and I think to, to ignore that is, is, I think, to not see the, big, the longer picture. Um, one of the things those conventions do, of course, they don't have any targets in them. We set targets in the, in the political declarations. We say, well, okay, by 2008, we'll achieve something. Well, that didn't work. By 2015, we'll achieve something. Well, that won't work. The next time, we're going to say 2030 or something like that. Uh, they don't set those targets in the drugs conventions. They don't have a deadline, like, say, the Kyoto Protocol. Kyoto Protocol was designed to be renegotiated after 10 years, right? The drugs conventions don't do that. So what they do is they set themselves up as success and strategy at the exact same time. 
As long as you keep doing this, it looks like success because we've taken it on face value that this works. And I think that needs to be questioned because the evidence seems to suggest that supply reduction, which is the main strategy, does almost nothing. Um, except catch people in a, a never-ending cycle. So that's my first thing about leadership. I think there needs to be some courage to speak to the system and its failings and, its, and the opportunities to use other bits of international law instead. <clears throat> the second is, is, is uh, about leadership. It's something to do with a willingness to talk about the situation at home instead of always looking overseas and saying, well, look how bad that country is. Um, and that's in both good and bad ways. I said um, some really important things about Sweden here in terms of the standard of living here, in terms of um, health care, education, um, income inequality, although maybe that's not going in the right direction. The thing is to change the, the focus of what Sweden talks about. So if Sweden goes to the UN and keeps talking up the system, as it has done in the past, and protects it, or keeps talking up this idea of a restrictive and humane policy, I don't even know what that means, but it keeps talking that up, then the danger is that you legitimize repression, right? And at the same time misrepresent the reality here in Sweden which is far more complicated and, 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 uh, and much different. So for me, what a difference it would make if Sweden went to the UN and said, we're quite proud that we have 50 to 60% OST coverage. That's a really good thing for us. And we're very worried about overdose death rates and we're looking to scale up whatever the government's planning on to deal with it. Um, we're, we're concerned about the health inequality between our first and second biggest cities in that one of them has needle exchange and the other doesn't. I live in the by the way, but um, these things change the nature of the debate away from drugs. It's kind of a, a weird thing for me. I actually don't care about drugs or drug policy very much. I care what drug policies are supposed to achieve. The reason I'm in it is issues of, of, of uh, social justice. But the what if Sweden went in there and said, look, here's the situation here. Let's present this. Um, we're concerned about this and we're happy about this. And stop mentioning restrictive reproaches. Stop bolstering that because it doesn't mean anything. And the problem with that is Sweden has a reputation I don't think it deserves because it's diplomacy. See, in diplomacy, what you say is all that matters. That's, you just speak on the floor and that's the, that's the rep. No one's going to go and check, right? So that's the message. And um, the problem with that too is it, it, uh, if, you, if you challenge the system and you speak honestly about the situation here, it changes Sweden's position, but it changes in doing it. It's... Um, its partnerships, or the people it tends to find itself allied with. Um, you recognize probably Maria Larson there. Yeah. Do you recognize anybody else? Maybe you recognize him. On either side of Maria Larson, do you know who those people are? Yes. Right, so, well, you would. But on one side, we've got Gil Kerlikovsky, right? That's the, US, the former US drug czar. The new guy is, um, I think it's still Michael Botticelli. On the other side is Viktor Ivanov. Now, in my view, Russia, in a human rights terms and drug policy terms, is the country you want to get as far away from as possible. And the only reason you find yourself sitting beside them is if you ignore everything I just said about the reality here, and you partner to resist reform. That seems to me to be the wrong thing to do, because it misrepresents Sweden. So I don't think that was such a great idea. It's not such a big deal. It's, I think this is long forgotten. It was a few years ago in a small thing. But that's not the kind of partnership Sweden wants in my view. And the thing is, Russia's gearing up to build up a, a, um, a coalition against substitution therapy for the young guys. It's going to try and build up countries to fight against that. So does Sweden find itself allied with that or on the other side of it? I think, I think on the other side of it, given what actually happens here, and it should speak up for that, and I hope it does. Um, I think instead, I mean, the interesting thing is, I think Sweden shares more with Portugal than it does with the Russian Federation, even though court Portugal decriminalized, because Portugal invested in health and social care at the same time. Uh, and that's the partner you want. It's not about the, 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 the specific drug policy, but it's about, for me anyway, what matters uh, beneath that. Um, you know, what a difference it would make for me if... Sweden, in terms of partnership, turned up at the Ungas with Svenska Brücke for ending on its delegation, like Matt was on the UK delegation. That would be a big change, a very important symbolic change to say we respect 
uh, these voices. And not just that, we do this at home anyway. Svenska uh, Brukeforeningen is on these kinds of panels. Why not speak to that at the international level? Um, so I guess that leads me to, uh, let me say something. This was just popped into my mind as people were talking about the Sustainable Development Goals, and it speaks to Sweden's reputation, right? This is the third goal. These are all agreed now, and the targets, and uh, there's a lot more targets than that. But can you see target 3.5? Strengthen the prevention and treatment of substance abuse, including narcotic drug abuse and harmful use of alcohol. Um, that got in there, and no one quite knows how. But the first time it got in, uh, the footnote said it was Sweden's idea. So I emailed the ambassador in New York, because everyone thinks, yeah, that's the kind of thing Sweden would do. And it wasn't Sweden. Sweden didn't do that. But people thought, yeah, it was probably them. So that got in there, and nobody quite knows how. But it shows how easily this kind of stuff gets into um, declarations. Look at, as well, look at all the other targets. They all have a deadline on them, and that one doesn't, because no one knew what to do with it. It's a, it's a meaningless uh, statement in these super new declaration uh, goals we have. Um, so that leads me to, to some of my recommendations. I've made some already. Um, I've not written them down uh, on, on the slide. Um, one of them is, yeah, to influence the, the terms of the debate, uh, to talk about the drugs conventions in their contemporary context, and don't just defend them because it's, it's awkward to, to, to change them. Of course they're not going to get changed anytime soon, but looking to the future, there's a, Sweden stands up for a lot of other things in the world, and this is, this is just one. It seems to me to, that the important thing to do is to take those other things far more seriously on the international stage. And there's two ideas I've had for that. One of them is an idea that uh, we had at the University of Essex and uh, we've promoted for a while, and the UN Development Programme is now backing, which is international guidelines on human rights while countering the world drug problem. Uh, akin to the kinds of standards we have around counter-terrorism, HIV, transnational corporations and so on. And that would involve a lot of study, a lot of questions that uh, would both be illuminating of themselves, but the standards at the end would be an interesting benchmark against which to measure states' performance. And the other thing, given that children are talked about so often, uh, an idea we've had, and uh, I'll be launching a report on it soon, is use the young gas to launch a global study on the impact of drug policies on children and young people. If the promise is to protect children, then prove it. Uh, and use the Convention on the Rights of the Child as a framework for measuring what's happened. That includes how many kids use drugs. That includes how many parents are in prison because of minor drug offences. That includes how many children have been displaced because of crop reduction strategies. It includes how many children uh, have been forced into those detention centres I had a picture of. And so on and so forth. Many questions we can ask. Uh, I think Sweden could lead by example in, I said already, changing what it says about its own home situation. But here's a big one, and this is probably the hardest uh, of everything I've said. Matt earlier mentioned how disastrous the funding situation is for HIV-related harm reduction. It's really low. It's about 7% of what's needed from international donors. Sweden is a really strong HIV donor, but not in the harm reduction sense. So my advice to Sweden is throw some money at the International Harm Reduction for HIV Response. It will be both a symbolic and a practical huge step. I already mentioned removing the objection uh, from Bolivia, which I think would be fairly easy. And I already mentioned putting Svenska Bruke for any on the delegation. And those are my recommendations. I'll take any questions or concerns or, or uh, arguments. Thanks.